Are you a comics fan? Do you like comics? There was a time when we used to read newspapers. And uh, some of us, we turned to that comic strip section and we start reading the comics first. And you follow those comics. I'm not a big fan of comics or anything like that. But a few years ago, someone launched a most bizarre comic concept. Have you heard about Garfield minus Garfield? Garfield minus Garfield. Next picture. I, I, I don't get it, you know. <laughs> but, uh, it's a, a reproduction of some of the daily Garfield comic strip, but without the famous cat, Garfield. Does it make sense? But some people swear they find this most amusing, amazing. They could develop their imaginations, you know, and if they know the concept, they understand what's going on. But unless you know the full concept, I think you will just walk away feeling something, something is missing. Yeah, Garfield is missing. There's no Garfield. Right? In the Garfield comics, and there's no Garfield. On the 4th of July weekend, my family and I and had an opportunity, uh, somewhat great opportunity, to go on a camping trip uh, with a couple of other families of LCC for the first time, for the first time as a family. And it was a great experience. What a fun experience that was. And we had such a great time. I think because because we went along with the experts, you know, campers. But family camping trip can be, and it is, after experiencing it, a great opportunity to create some great fun memories. And, and like I said, thanks to our expert campers, uh, I think our family had it easy at this time. But usually there are certain things you should take on any camping trip, like tent. But thanks to our campers, uh, we didn't have to bring our tent. I, we didn't have tent that will fit all our families. But also sleeping bags. Oh, boy. We realized you need really, really good sleeping bags. The first night, we were okay. But the second night, we were, like, freezing, you know. Usually, my wife gives me, gives me that, you know, her, her, her back to me. But that night, she was, like, clinging on to me and hugging me. And, uh, yes, I think we should go on camping more often. So we, we realized we need a really good sleeping bags. And flashlights, for example. But just like everything else in life, a camping trip gets a lot more complicated, especially when you add children, and especially if you add your favorite pet. Our dog Milo went along with us because I couldn't find the pet boarding. It was all booked, 4th of July weekend. I should have known better, but it was our first time experience. Next time I'll make an appointment from uh, much in advance. So it can be very complicated, but at the same time, you know, that's what the fun is all about, where fun is all about, right? I mean, you have to go with your kids and with your people that you love. And that's camping, enjoying nature, laughing together, and making fire-toasted s'mores, okay? What's camping without s'mores, right? We had a lot of s'mores. These kids, right, consuming s'mores like... There's never, you know, not, they're, they're eating s'mores all night. But there's an endless list of must-have camping gears. You could have them all. List 1 to 100. You could have them all. But you know what? Camping without people that you love is like Facebook without friends. It's like YouTube without videos. It's like Google without results. So if you want to have a really good camping, you have to go with the people that you love. And that's what camping makes the best. And this book that I read some time ago by the title of Christless Christianity. Anybody heard of this book? Christless Christianity. I mean, the word Christless doesn't even exist. But the title of the book is called Christless Christianity. It's written by Michael Horton, not Michael Thornton. Okay, Michael Thornton is our youth pastor. But Michael Horton is a professor of Westminster Theological Seminary in California. And he said, here we are in North American church, conservative or liberal, evangelical or not, uh, mainline, Protestant or Catholic, emergent or otherwise, cracking along just fine. And thank you, 
And he goes on and says, so we are busy downsizing, becoming culturally relevant, reaching out, drawing in, making disciples, managing the missionary, utilizing biblical principles, celebrating recovery, user-friendly, techno-savvy, uh, finding the purposeful life, practicing peace with justice, utilizing spiritual disciplines, growing in self-esteem, reinventing ourselves as effective ecclesiastical entrepreneurs. And in general, feeling ever so much better about our achievements. But notice anything missing in this pretty picture? And he says, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is missing indeed. So what happens when you uh, take Christ out of Christianity? Does it make sense? You take Christ out of Christianity. Can you imagine church without Christ? What would church be like if there is no Christ? What about you know, being a Christian but have no Christ? Can there be any church? Can there be any church without Christ? Is it possible? But just like the new comic concept that I mentioned, Garfield minus Garfield, people seem to be fine with church minus Christ. In fact, some people like that. They don't want to be pressured by the message of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because there's so much to give up. There's so much to sacrifice. It's not about me. It's, not, it's, it's, it's all about God. And people don't like to hear things like that. The reality of the Christianity today has lost the very essence of the faith in Jesus. Do you even know who Jesus Christ is? Do you even know what Christ has done for you and what He is asking you to do? Taking up your own cross and following Him. Do we understand what that means? Current studies show that Christians have always had their differences, but never in church history have there been so many statistics indicating that many Christians today are practicing what can only be described as Christianity with no Christ. In other words, Christless Christianity. I know this is a heavy topic, very heavy topic. And we can go on and on and on about this topic, talking about it. But many conservative and well-respected pastors like John Piper, John MacArthur, Paul Washer, along with Michael Horton, are addressing this issue very seriously. Altogether, they rebuke Joel Osteen, the pastor of Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas, as the clearest example in contemporary American religion. Name it, claim it, health, wealth, and prosperity, gospel. And these are the nicknames for a heresy, they say, that in many respects is an extreme version of perhaps the most typical focus of American Christianity today more generally. And this is the problem that we are faced with Christians, like you and I, who try so hard to love God and understand what the love of God is for us. But not only this is affecting the churches in America, but this is affecting many churches in Africa, in Indonesia, in many third world countries, every corner, every single church, whether it's small or big, whether it's small or mega church, the prosperity gospel is being preached, and it's not gospel at all. There's no Christ. Basically, God is there for you and for your happiness kind of message. As if God exists for us. We don't want to exist for God. We want God to exist for my needs. What I want, what I desire. He has some rules and principles of getting what you want out of life. And if you follow them, you can have what you want. Just declare it. Just believe and believe and believe. And think positive, positively then you will get it. The prosperity will come to you. You are destined to be blessed. And this is what all the pastor that I'm, I just mentioned says against the prosperity gospel. And John MacArthur said about Joel Osteen during one of his sermons on Sunday. He said, he is now the largest quote-unquote church. I am using the word loosely in America down in Houston. Why? Because he doesn't believe that that's the church. You need to understand that he is pagan religionist in every sense. He is a quasi-pantheist. 
The Jesus is footnote that satisfies his critics and deceives his followers. The idea of his whole thing is that men have the power in themselves to change their lives. The idea is that whatever you want, whatever you desire, you make God out of it. Like a form of idol worshiping. So that material possession, health and wealth becoming their idol and there is no Christ in it. You are just using Jesus to get what you want. And I'm afraid, and I'm afraid that sometimes, me as a pastor, maybe I fall into that temptation, just using the name of Jesus to get what I want. Maybe some of us are falling into that that temptation, letting Jesus up front, but in reality there is no Jesus in their lives. You can create your life the way you want your life to be. You can create your world the way you want your world to be. Because you want Jesus to fulfill your desires. And that's not a church. So this is how the church looks like without Christ. Centered around me, not centered around Christ. But I want to say and emphasize on this. My brothers and sisters of Logo Sensor Chapel, and all the visitors who have come, Christ is real, and we have a real calling. Christ is so real, and we have a real calling. You see, it is easy to become distracted from Christ. Even as we do good things, even as we do for the sake of the glory of God, many times we say that all this is for the glory of God. Many times we say, oh, this is for God, But in reality, God is not in the picture, but we are in the center of the picture. It is easy to become distracted from Christ as the only hope for sinners. Where everything is measured by our happiness rather than by God's holiness. The sense of our being sinners becomes secondary, if not offensive. Nobody wants to hear that we are sinners, that we are needy. That we are broken. We love to say these words, but we don't want to believe it. We don't want to accept it. The sense of, a sense of our being sinners becomes secondary, if not offensive. And, and listen carefully. Many would think that if, if we are good, inherently good people, who just have, have lost our ways, but with the proper instructions and motivations, we can become a better person then we need only a life coach. We only need a good motivating speaker, not a redeemer. We need a good teacher, and this is what's happening many churches around the world, especially in America. People want to be intellectually challenged, and, and there's no, nothing wrong with it, because we have so many intellectual people. But we have a bunch of Christians who just want to be taught and feel good about themselves. They need a teacher, not a savior. Do you really need a savior to save you? Or do you need a teacher who could say a good words? Jesus is not just a moral and, and, and ethical, exemplary or imaginary figure, but he is real. And he died for you and I. And he conquered death. And that's the reason why we sing songs like, We Believe in the Resurrection. He's so real that He is here with us right now, willing to engage into a real relationship with you. We can still give our assent to a high view of Christ and the centrality of His person and work, but unfortunately, but unfortunately, in actual practice, we are being distracted from looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith. Jesus doesn't come first. But anything else, everything else comes first. I mean, we do it all in the name of Jesus, aren't we? In the name of Jesus. We bless it. In the name of Jesus. All this in the name of Jesus. But there is no real Jesus. There is no Christ. There is no Redeemer. There is no Savior. Then it's a lie. Everything that we do, it's a lie. And the Bible describes it as falsehood, hypocrisy. Go with me, go back with me to verse 25. 
He says, therefore, I have an NIV, each of you must put up falsehood, hypocrisy, a lie, and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are members of one body. Last week, we learned about how we have hope or harmony, right? Remember that? We have hope or harmony and unity and oneness, all for one and one for Christ. And that was from Peter. Apostle Peter. Now, Apostle Paul here, in the same notion, he urges to the people of God to live a life worthy of the calling we have received in the context of keeping the unity and the peace of the church. Go with me to verse 2 and following. He says, but be completely, verse 2, humble and gentle. Sounds familiar? I mean, we're, we're looking at these two different authors, Peter and here Paul, but saying the same thing because the same spirit. Right? He says, be completely humble and gentle. Why? Because it's the character of Lord Jesus Christ. Remember the, the word humble meaning, right? Friend, friendly kind. The friendly kindness. Jesus Christ dying for a friend. Dying for you. Right? Because Christ is humble and gentle, we must be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the blood of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. You and I have this holy and worthy calling to live as Christians in unity, in harmony. Having the marks of Christ, being made more like a Christ. In other words, being compassionate towards one another. All this is for what? All this is for what? For Christ. Would you go with me to verse 12? He says, all this is for to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up, so that the body of Christ church with Christ. The body of Christ will be built up until we are rich unity in the faith and the knowledge of this Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Until we reach the fullness. It's already and not yet. Already we have been united in faith in God. Through faith in Jesus Christ, we are one. We are already one. We have this unity, you have this harmony, but not yet. But until then, until then, you and I, we have this calling to be one. To be there for one another. To live for Jesus Christ. You see, the essence of this harmony, the unity, the oneness, the peace we so desire is the Christ Without Christ, there's no harmony. Without Christ, there's no unity. Without Christ, there's no oneness. And this is the reason why we call ourselves church. Logos Central Chapel. It is the church of God, people of God. Set aside, set apart for the greater purpose. Otherwise, we could be just a bunch of Asian American, Korean American who had some commonalities of being immigrants or whatnot coming together like a social gathering. And we don't want that. And that's not church. Apostle Paul begins with the com- uh, command to walk worthy of our calling, with a reminder to leave behind our old ways of life, putting off the old self and putting on a new self. Chapter 4, verse 17. And chapter 4, verse 20 talks about the new self. Therefore, if we want to maintain the harmony and the unity, then we must know for sure that we have Christ in our lives. So do you have Christ? That means, are you willing to die for Him? Are you willing to lay down your life for Him and be obedient to His Word? Do you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? That means, are you letting Jesus Christ sitting in the center of your throne in your life to let Jesus Christ rule and lead your life? Or are you still struggling to rule your own life and God to to assist and help 
and just be there to fulfill your own dreams. Jesus is the reason why you and I are here. And Jesus is the reason why I am here sharing this message to you. Jesus is the power, that power. Jesus is the one who can change and transform not only in my life, not only your life, but he can change certainly through our lives to many people's lives. And Jesus is the only key that can lead us to holiness. And Apostle Paul, when he comes to our text, and that's what he does, he gives the seven golden rules, sort of speak, not to gain our status as a new creation, but because we are a new creation, because we have been made new, He gives us the seven golden rules, so to speak, to glorify God and to preserve unity and peace. And the first thing He mentioned is putting off our falsehood in the context of relationship with others, especially to fellow believers in the church. In other words, there has to be a genuine confession of faith in Jesus to one another, that Jesus is the only hope for this dying generation. So whenever we, we, whenever we come to worship and when, whenever we come to fellowship with one another, there has to be a genuine confession and testimony how Jesus Christ has changed my life. What He has done, what He is doing, and what He will do, that we will share the genuine testimony with one another. And praising God for that. But church nowadays off, offers lies. A blaspheming lies. The false message of hope and prosperity. Yes, there is hope in Jesus. Yes, there is hope in heaven. But we need more. We need more. Hope that is existential. Something that you can realize here. Nothing wrong with that. But that's a secondary that's, That should, should not and cannot be the primary reason why we come here. It's not so much about what God wants, but what I want type of mentality, type of hope. If you serve God faithfully, if you work hard in what you do, if you give enough to God, you can make it type of mentality and hope. That's the prosperity gospel. And that is the reality of the people of the church nowadays. But in actuality, there's no Jesus in their life. There's no Christ. There's no Redeemer. And 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5 describes it really well. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Denying its power of the gospel. And you know what Paul says? Have nothing to do with such people. Wow. What kind of people are we talking about? They act religious, but they will reject the gospel. They are actually afraid of accepting the truth. You know, they will hate to follow God. They'd rather God to follow them. They don't like to accept the truth. They don't want to hear that you're wrong. The true God, the power that could make them godly, they refuse. And this, my friend, is the falsehood that Paul is talking about here in our passage. So what is Christless church? What is Christless Christianity? Simply put it, it's a pseudo-Christianity. Does anybody know what pseudo means? Right? Everybody knows what that means, right? Pseudo means what? Fake. Not genuine. False. Quasi. And that's the exact vocabulary that was used in our original text. In Greek, the word falsehood is the word pseudos. Pseudos. A lie. Untrue. Conscious and intentional falsehood. And this is what Joel Austin said in one of his interview with Oprah Winfrey. Why is it conscious and intentional falsehood? Because he said, he says, you know, I don't even have to mention that they're sinners. Why do I, why do I want to defend, offend them? Why do, I want to, why, do, why do I want to make them feel bad? Because they all know when they do wrong. I just want to tell them how potential, how much potential they have how much uh, they're blessed from the very beginning. I don't have to mention that they're sinners. This is so-called conscious and intentional falsehood. 
in a broad sense, whatever is not what it seems to be. That's falsehood that Paul is talking about. So local central chapel, what kind of church are we? When you look at LCC, when you look at one another, your neighbors, your fellow believers, what do you see? Do you see hypocrisy or do you see Christ? I said, we are a bunch of sinners who are forgiven by the grace of God. You and I, we live because of Christ and His grace and mercy. And that's what it means to be humble. Admitting our shortcomings and our brokenness. And admitting our our, our need for Christ. Letting Jesus to rule in our lives. What kind of church are we? And I want to say this, and we want to hold on to this. LCC is a church with Christ. Marked by His death and resurrection. Church with the people changed and transformed by the power of the gospel. Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, and He is our Redeemer. And Jesus is the reason why we are here. So believe in God and also believe in Jesus. He's the way and the truth and the life. He's the only source of our hope. Therefore, let us put off falsehood. Let us just stop pretending to be a Christian. Let us come to the throne of grace and ask God for His mercy. Along with the rest of the list, Paul continues to say, if you get angry, Don't sin in the process, verse 26. Quit being a taker and start being a giver. The reason why God allows you to work is for you to share with others. And we have many, many works to do in this world. You just heard what's, what's going on in Israel, in Gaza. Do you know what's going on in the Middle East with the ISIS militants killing people like it's, it's nothing? And in verse 29, it says, watch what comes out of your mouth. I think this is, this is what we really need to give our ears to. Because, you know, Satan is very clever. God created the world with what, with what? With his words. And Satan is using that power against us. And because of words, we hurt people. We destroy church. We destroy family. So watch what comes out of your mouth. The things that do flow from our mouth should build one another up, not put them down. In verse 30, it says, Don't hurt the Holy Spirit of God by your words and actions. The Holy Spirit is a person. When He is hurt, when we sin against each other by condemning, by judging, or even gossiping. Get rid of all evil. And finally, verse 32, it says, Let us be more like Christ. Because he says, be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other. This is exactly what Christ has done for you and I. So church without Christ is like a moon without sun. It's like cell phone or smartphone with no signal. I get that a lot. In my neighborhood, Verizon is really weak. I have one of the best cell phones in the world, iPhone 5. But it doesn't work. It's useless. Church without Christ. It's like a smartphone with no signal. It's like a heart missing its beat. It's like a broken pencil. Pointless. Without Christ, there's no redemption for our broken conditions. Just condemnation of our struggles. Without Christ, there's no power to vanquish sin and death. Just the wicked arm of flesh trying desperately for a perfection it can never attain. Without Christ, there is no joy, but rather a dreadful commandment to rejoice without really knowing why. Without Christ, we are, of all men, most miserable. So Christ is all and is in all. Without Christ, we are nothing. Without Christ, I am nothing and you are nothing. And there is no else to see. Christ be the center of our church and of our lives. Let's pray.